All right, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about Adequacy, which is an experimental systems programming language that I've been working on for the past year with Jay. Um, adequacy is like an imagining of what systems programming might be like if racket programmers ruled the world and use racket to do everything. And it's meant to sort of uh, look at domains where C is currently used, even though it's really inadequate for those tasks and try to improve upon that status quo. And so broadly, our overall philosophy with the programming language is that programs should have a provable space and time utilization. Uh, that means that you can prove statically how long your program will take to execute, as well as how much memory it'll consume. And neither of those worst cases will be infinity. We also use Racket for metaprogramming in C because we're Racket programmers and we like macros. And we also want to integrate easily into existing C projects. We compile into C right now, partially because that's attractive for a new language to just compile into C, but also because we have a philosophy of doing things the C way and maintaining compatibility with C code. Um, being compatible with C code is partially because we want people to actually use the language, but also because we recognize that every great formally verifiable program has an unverifiable system behind it, invoking it and using it, and so we want to be compatible with that. Uh, but let's move on to a code example before I get too deep into that stuff. This is a function that uh, calculates a Fibonacci number at a given index, so you give it a number and it gives you the Fibonacci number corresponding to it. Our syntax is like Racket in the fact that we use S expressions and a lot of the same primitives as a Racket, but we are statically typed, so there's type annotations for the methods and the return type. We uh, have slightly different syntax for defining things. You'll notice with this temp variable, we allow you to define a variable without assigning a value to it, just like in other systems languages. We have while as a primitive construct, unlike Racket. We even have an increment operator, which we call plus equals one. And at the end of this function, it returns just by saying A, or you can return A explicitly. It doesn't make a difference. You can use add, yes, sorry? I might have unbalanced parens. That's very possible. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This example has unbalanced parens. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you can use adequacy as a hash lang. Uh, so here we have an abbreviated version of the function that I just showed you. It calls the function, prints its value, and then returns zero. Because remember, we're like C, so when everything goes okay, you return zero from main. And hash lang adequacy is okay for like demoing or exploring the syntax of the language, but we really think that it's better to use adequacy as a library. And so here we say define program fibp, and that gives you a racket object that represents your program so that you can do things like interact with our linker. We provide a module that lets you uh, compile your program into like some temporary file and then link it with the racket ffi so that you can call it directly from Racket and get back values that you can use for tests. Uh, we use the type information better in your program to make this safer than it otherwise would be. And so this tprog n macro at the bottom here is basically saying compile this program and then invoke the public function fib with all these values and check that they match the expected result. And so we think this is a better way to write C pro or a better way to test C programs than the way people do that currently. Uh, but now that I've given you a code example, let's get into the first big topic, which is the space and time characteristics of your program, or as I like to call it, the space-time complexity of the program. Uh, we want to have provable upper bounds for everything, meaning we want programs that always terminate in a known amount of time and that never overcommit memory or stack overflow. They can't crash once the program started, and they have to be memory safe in the traditional sense that you can't like uh, use an index that's out of bounds for an array. And so this means that we can't really mo uh, model our programs as a Turing machine. It doesn't really work. We have to use a DFA. And so when you model your programs as DFAs, uh, de sorry, definite finite automaton, it's like a less powerful uh, theoretical model for a computer. So Turing machines are assumed to have like infinite amounts of memory. And even though our computers don't have infinite amounts of memory, when you use C, the C language assumes that. It just says that when you malloc something, you get back the memory, and it's system defined whether it works or not. So that's the way most people write programs, especially like garbage collected programs, including Racket. You just dump everything into memory and assume it's gonna work. We can't do that when we want these 
kinds of guarantees. So we use a stricter model for our program uh, that is useful for enforcing those guarantees, but it also requires us to impose limits on programmers. So they can't write infinite loops or even indeterminate loops. Code like this, which just gets a node and then continues to get nodes while the nodes aren't null, you can't write it in adequacy because no one really knows if this program will terminate. What does get next node actually do? Maybe it gets the nodes from a graph with a cycle in it and it'll never end and you'll get nodes forever. Maybe it's up to do something to decide when the loop should terminate. Uh, you can write programs like this that are correct and useful, but we don't want that model of programming for the kinds of domains that we're targeting, like safety critical or uh, data oriented programming. So in addition to no infinite loops, you can't have recursion or function pointers. You can operate only on static memory, which means we don't give you access to malloc or free and we do a verification pass with whore logic over the program, so that's to enforce other kinds of formal verification things like not uh, indexing out of bounds. This may seem like a very austere way to program computers, and it definitely is, but one of the insights of this language is that for these kinds of highly optimized or domains where you can't fail, you really want to program like that anyway. Like if you were making Super Mario Brothers and you're trying to implement the guy who throws spinies at you, you wouldn't call Malik every time he throws a spiny, you would set like a static limit on the total number of spinies that he can throw and then write code that never goes over that limit. And so we embrace austerity and adequacy because there are uh, safety benefits and performance benefits to operating that way. Um, perhaps most obviously is cache coherency like we, we uh, because we only operate on static memory, we're able to lift all the definitions of data up to the top level and put them just in a blob that the rest of the program wires up to. So you can have your data laid out any way you want. Uh, people who do, do data oriented programming already do this in C, but they have to do it manually. Like if you don't want to cross over that cache line, then you have to put in the padding manually to keep the uh, layout exactly how you want it. And that'll be different for different machines. It, it's very arduous. And so we, a lot, we want to uh, offer a way to do that programmatically with some kind of grammar that'll just say, you know, here, here's the line between the caches. We also think that this will be helpful in solving the array of structs versus structure of array problem. Uh, this is the idea that sometimes you have large objects that are conceptually one object, but for performance reasons, they really should be multiple objects. I'm gonna use the example of a game again, because I love games. Let's say you have like a game object, and you have the, the sprite and the physics body. Uh, the typical pattern for a game updating itself for a frame is to go through all the physics bodies and do the physics updates, and then go through all the sprites and do the drawing. But if you have an array of players, then these uh, sprites and bodies are, are intermingled with each other. And so they pollute your cache line. You get worse performance than if you had an array of sprites and an array of bodies and were able to just quickly go over each array in turn. And so we wanna provide grammars that'll allow you to have something which is conceptually a game object, like one object which you can store in an array, but then the storage will allow you to pull that out and arrange it however you want. Uh, and so now that you've gotten an idea of why you might want to use adequacy, let's get into the specific grammar that you'd use to write adequacy programs. Uh, these, this is a description of the runtime types. You have all the machine types that you'd expect, S8 up to S64, unsigned types, floating point types. We have arrays which are always uh, statically known their size. So you can't have an array that changes size or th the size of which is determined at runtime it always has to be statically known, which is in keeping with our philosophy of modeling the program as a DFA. We have records, which are identical to C structs. They're just organized data. And we have unions, uh, which are important to have, certainly, for these kinds of programs, because you might want to have one piece of data that you look at multiple ways. We also have external types, which basically means trust me. It's essentially equivalent to like a string that you insert into the C program that represents the type. Uh, we also have paths, which are equivalent to L values in C. So the grammar for a path is it's either a, var a variable, a global, uh, a select statement, 
which is like indexing an array. It takes a path to the array as well as an expression which evaluates to the index in the array. Uh, field is just index, uh, taking the field of a struct. Modes are just taking the mode of a union, so deciding that I wanna look at this union as the specific type and not as the whole union. And we have external variables, which again, like external types, just mean trust me. It's for when you have to interact with the outside world and look at some type that we don't support explicitly. Uh, expressions are uh, for producing values. They can't have any side effects. So we have uh, primitive integers and floats. Um, cast, read, and bin op are, are pretty self-explanatory. Read is like reading a path. So if you were to use a path in an expression, it would take the form of a read. We also have let e, which is just a bit of syntactic sugar. We actually duplicate the variable that you declare uh, throughout the expression. So it's really important that expressions can't have side effects for that to work. And we also have if e, which is basically the ternary operator in uh, C. Uh, initializers are how we initialize data. So an initializer can be a constant expression or it can be like zero, which is equivalent to uh, open brace zero, close brace in C, just saying that you want the memory to be zeroed out. You can also, we also have special initializers for arrays, records, and unions, which work how you'd expect. Um, and you can also have undefined as an initializer. Undefined is valid as an initializer, but not as an expression. It's just a way of saying that we don't want to initialize this piece of memory. Statements are for control flow, uh, declaring variables and mutating variables. Skip just means do nothing. It's our version of void. Uh, fail means exit the program immediately because something went wrong. We have begin, and, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory, and assign, which is for mutating variables. Uh, if and while, again, are pretty self-explanatory. We also support jump and let with escape continuation, which is pretty surprising because um, you don't normally associate those kinds of control structures with like a formally verified language, but I'll, I'll get to why those are useful in a couple slides. We have let, which is exactly what it sounds like, it's just for declaring a new variable, and call. So one of the idiosyncrasies of our language is that every invocation of a function must declare a new variable. And so calling a function works like declaring a variable with let, where you assign the result of the function call to some name and then all the rest of your code, that at least in the current function, that happens after that call statement goes in the body, the same way it would go in the body of a let statement. And that's also useful for a reason I'll get to in a sec. Here's an example of let with an escape continuation for anyone who didn't know what that means. Um, it's basically like the equivalent of like a loop that only executes once, but then you can break out of it if you want to. So like here's an example where x is equal to some value that we don't necessarily know. And then we have a let with escape continuation where we say when x is less than zero, we print x is negative, and then we invoke end, which means skipping to the end of the escape continuation, uh, skipping the thing that means x is non-negative, which would make sense. Uh, moving on to functions, you can have internal functions or external functions. Internal functions are like real functions you uh, define adequacy, and external functions, like with the other external types, just mean trust me. The definition for internal functions is different than in a lot of other languages. All functions return, uh, all functions define a variable that is their return variable. And so uh, it is always the variable that, con that contains the return value. And they also define a return label. So this is the label that you jump to when you want to return. This is really abnormal. Like most programming languages just say that when you return from a function, you return the value but we say that returning from a function means that you place the value in a specific variable and then jump to a specific label in the code. Uh, so like returning a value isn't really a first class concept. We construct it from these two things. The reason why that's useful is for inlining. Uh, C has like really bad inlining. The, uh, there are like rules in the standard. I don't think it's uh, necessarily like common for C compilers to uh, inline certain uses of a function, but not other uses of the function. But that's something that we want to support. And so if you have let with escape continuation in this definition of a function, it's pretty trivial to inline them because every function is called by a call statement which declares a new variable. So you can just say that the return label is the escape continuation out of the let ec block and the 
uh, return variable is the variable that uh, call is declaring, and you can always inline your functions without uh, having to worry about them polluting the environment that they're entering. Functions, types, and global variables are also held anonymously by reference to the racket object that defines them. So like when you create a, uh, when you, for example, call a function, we don't give the function a name and then store that name. We just store a reference to the racket object containing the AST for that function. Uh, this is unusual, but it's useful because it enforces our no recursion rule for free. We construct our AST out of racket objects that are just standard immutable racket objects. So because of that, they can't have references to themselves, and two racket objects also cannot have references to one another, like mutually, unless of course they're mutable, but ours aren't. And so this means that you just can't use recursion uh, from something constructed that way. If you want to, you can have a function that references another distinct but otherwise identical function, and then that function could reference another distinct but otherwise identical function, and you could do that up to some static depth of nested functions, but there would always be a static limit on how many times you could do that. And so that's in keeping with our philosophy of modeling the program as a DFA. Uh, so in order to make this uh, nice to write, we supply a macro for each category of syntax that gives it bracket-like syntax. So for expression, the macro is called E. So here's two examples of expressions, plus two and two. This is obviously a binary operation. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see our syntax for casting uh, the variable X into a sine 32-bit. Statements are similar. Uh, here's examples for set and for, for let. You'll notice that in let, uh, there's a lot of type annotation. Some of it can sometimes be omitted. Uh, here's types again, and a lot of these, uh, this one's less self-explanatory. So on the left-hand side, you have the syntax for selecting a field. We just use like a right pointing arrow. And on the right-hand side, you have the syntax for indexing an array. We use the at sign for that. Uh, initializers, again, a constant expression can be an initializer. So if you put an expression inside an initializer block, it'll work as long as it's a constant expression. And you can also, uh, on the right-hand side here, you have an example of like a record. And here is syntax for like an anonymous function. And here's the syntax for uh, a program. So you define a program with, with my prog, and then inside of it you can have all these statements together. Um, but we don't necessarily want you to put all of your program inside of your program statement. We believe in constructing the abstract syntax tree uh, incrementally through metaprogramming with Racket. So you can define these things outside of the program block and then include them. And that's a way of saying that these things are public because they're inside the program block. Uh, so like if you had a update helper function for this update function, you don't necessarily want the helper to be public, so you just wouldn't include it. But because you use it inside of update, it still gets included in the program, just not publicly. Uh, each type also has a meta type associated with it. So like if you construct a number but you don't tell the compiler what type it is, it'll, put, it'll infer the smallest type that it can for that literal value, but it'll also tag it with a meta value saying this is like a free number. So it can be implicitly cast into a larger value if it needs to be so that programmers don't have to constantly insert cast statements for things that are obvious. Um, and you can also mess, nest meta objects inside of one another. So like this is a meta expression that is a free number but also has type information attached to it. And you'll notice that we just like create like a linked list of the expressions where it's a meta expression that contains another meta expression that contains the real expression at the bottom. Uh, we also use meta types to hold invariants for functions and loops. Uh, the, so that's like, an invariant that the verifier pass would look at and try to make sure is true and otherwise reject the program. We hold these things as metadata because they aren't actually core to the language. The core language is unsafe and the verifier is an optional pass over it. 
Uh, even though we think of verification as being central to the way adequacy programs are written, it's technically an optional pass. And so if you wanted to write a front end for the compiler that was less strict, uh, you could do that by omitting the verification pass. In fact, most of the programs that we've written so far in adequacy have not used the verifier because right now we're more focused on stress testing the compiler and um, coming up with new ways of using metaprogramming to make the style of program easier than making sure that every single program we write is statically verifiable. And so that kind of brings us into the type system. Uh, the type system for adequacy is, is pretty novel, not the runtime type system, which basically mirrors C, and I've already gone over it. Um, the only other thing I'll say about it is that while it, um, primitive types like integers and floating points are passed by value, the same as in C, uh, complex types like arrays, records, and unions are passed by reference, the same as you'd see it as in like Racket and Java. Uh, this is because the storage for those types are always lifted out to the top level, as I mentioned previously. So you can, for example, have two array pointers which point to the same conceptual array, um, and that's okay. Right. So our type checker uh, can't work the way that type checkers in other languages typically work. T uh, because we allow you to construct the, the program through racket code that can come from anywhere, there's no global environment. Like this is the way a typical type checker works, the typical rule for saying that like some type is sound. Uh, but, we, but we don't have a gamma because we don't have an environment. You just get uh, expressions that are constructed you know, either from your program, but they could come from other compilation units or from other functions that are called at phase zero. In, in, so there is no global environment that says what every type means, so we have to take a different approach. Basically, when you create a piece of uh, syntax for adequacy, you get back both the syntax itself, but also uh, an environment that contains every variable that exists inside that piece of uh, the AST. And so uh, this is the part that's important it's like a hash just that goes from the name of the variable to the type. And so when the disparate pieces of your AST come together into one program, our type checker has to uh, make sure that, they, that all the references to the variables um, are consistent with each other and that they're ultimately consistent with the actual definition of the variable. The way we implement this is by implementing typed constructors. Basically, what this means is that if you call the constructor for an integer, for example, which we call int, you're not actually calling the constructor for an integer. You're calling a function which constructs the integer, calls a type checker on it, and then returns the meta expression containing both of those pieces of information. Uh, this is like how we implement that. It, it's the code that shadows the constructor that you give it and wraps it in something. You, you shouldn't try to read all of this, but this part in here is where most of the magic is. When you reference one of these bindings that we produce, what you get back is a lambda that takes the args that you apply to it, that you gave to it, applies it to the original constructor, and then calls this insurer function on it. All the insurer does is look at the uh, produced value and say, does this have a type? If it doesn't have a type, I will run the type checker on it. And Racket makes this approach really, really nice to do. Uh, because we have the module that defines the uh, AST nodes, and so that defines all these names, but then we also have the typed version of those names that come from the type mod checker module. And in any other language, the fact that we use the exact same names, they would conflict intractably with one another, and it would be a mess. But in Racket, this is practically idiomatic because it's really easy to uh, say something like, you know, for, for this is the syntax module. It requires all the definitions from both the AST module and the type checker module, but it wants the typed versions of the constructors. So we just say, give us all the imports from ASC.racket except for the ones that are in type.racket, and then import type.racket. And so that is like a set subtraction. It, it uh, only includes the typed versions of the constructors. 
Uh, that brings us to metaprogramming, which is kind of the last big topic for the language. Um, I've described a very uh, limited and austere way of writing programs that requires metaprogramming in order to really be feasible. No one wants to write programs using the primitives I've already described to you. They want to write macros that sort of construct those ASTs uh, based on richer information. And so for each one of those uh, type categories that I've gone over, we have a category of expanders that go with it. It's basically like a statically typed racket macro. Uh, it, it contains a syntax parser that is expected to produce the AST that you want. So like here's uh, the expander for when. When is like a really standard macro for Lisp-like languages. And in keeping with the tradition of Lisp-like languages and scheme-like languages, we have a really small core and then we build all this stuff on top of it as macros. So when you invoke when, you get this S, uh, this S statement at the bottom is what actually gets evaluated. Uh, here's the expander for not. It's a, kind of the same thing. Uh, notably, you know, we implement not as a bitwise XOR, the same that any other compiler was. We don't necessarily try to compile it into the C like bang operator. And again, there's different categories. So when is an S expander because it's a statement? Not is an E expander because it's an expression. If you try to use one in a context where the other is expected, you'll get an error. Uh, here is a little snippet of code from the E macro that actually consumes an E expander. So if it sees that the macro that you're using uh, is statically an E expander, like at phase one, then it'll call the E expand method on it. And so what you get at the, so if you give uh, the not macro to E, what you get is that expression at the bottom. And these categories are only interfaces. So bindings that are produced can conform to more than one of them at a time. Uh, for example, define type produces a binding that is both a T expander and an I expander. So if you say define type coord to be something resembling a coord, it'll be valid both in a T position and in an I position. This is how we get uh, syntax that resembles like what you see in constructors from other languages where you can just invoke the name of the thing you're creating and give the arguments as lists. And so that's something that's common in other languages, but we implement it as syntactic sugar using a macro system. All right. And lastly, I want to get into how we uh, handle lexical scope. Uh, here is a, an example of a let statement. It just declares a variable called x, sets it equal to 5, and then returns it from whatever function is, it's running in. This will be compiled into a let statement, which um, doesn't use the same name that you gave in the original syntax to represent the variable we uh, uniquify them. And, and so in this example, the x becomes x1, and that x1 symbol is the actual name of your variable in the program. But you'll notice that x1 and x don't match up. Like inside of the body of the let expression, we reference x again, but x isn't the name of our variable anymore. So how do we get these two things to match up? We do it by using uh, let syntax. So here is a simplified version of the code which actually produces a let statement from, a, uh, from let syntax. And so you can see we create XID, which is the actual name uh, at runtime of your variable, and we construct a, a var uh, which represents it. And then we use let syntax to say inside the body of the let statement, X refers to a P expander, which references this var. So going back to our original example, how do we get X1 and X to line up? We do it by enclosing the body of the let statement in a let syntax, which says X is equal to a P expander, which means X1. Um, all right, and no oh, time for demo, okay. Uh, then, yeah, any questions?
Um, hi, uh, so that looks very cool. Um, there's a system like this, and somebody would, people would probably know, like uh, an equivalent, uh, Terra and Lua. So this is clearly not um, Drew complete. So that's the main difference, but how do you contrast and compare, especially how Lua interacts with Terra and as opposed to Racket interacts with this system? I'm not, I'm not really familiar with Terra. I, I, know, I, I think of Lua as like a game scripting language, like it's supposed to interact with C. Um, I wouldn't... I'm familiar with Terra. We can talk about it later. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't necessarily compare this language to either of them because... As far as I know, Lua doesn't like impose any sorts of guarantees on the kinds of programs you can make, uh, and that's really central to, to this language. Is we, we sort of started with what kind of programs do we want to write for these really uh, for, for domains like data oriented or safety critical programming where you don't want to uh, I don't know, I'm not sure how to phrase it like you don't want to just write the code you want something a little uh, stricter than that. Like, you don't want to model your language on something that can loop forever or, or crash unexpectedly because, like, you stack overflowed. And, and everything else that we're doing, like, like formally verifying and using racket macros to make that style of programming easier for you is working backwards from that ideal. Hi, I'm Eric Eide from the University of Utah. I, I enjoyed your talk. So um, my question is, did, did you have to write your own compiler backend as well to get the guarantees that you stated at the beginning about uh, bounded space and time? Uh, no, so we did write a compiler. The compiler just generates C code, so it's not the most complicated compiler in the world or anything like that. Uh, the, the core language, like this, the grammar that I talk about, uh, like up here is all unsafe. Like the, the code that consumes these data types and creates C code out of it doesn't do any kind of sophisticated type checking or verification. The type checker and the verifier are passes that are applied to your program before it gets to that point. Yeah, so you'll, so uh, primitive types like integers, floats, and pointers, like references to your complex types are compiled on the stack. But you can statically determine how much stack space the program is going to utilize. Because you, you'll never have anything that's like, if this condition is true at runtime, then put something on the stack. It has to, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm, it's complicated. <laughs> when you design for um, fitting things into a cache line, you, you uh, tend to also be con um, very considerate of the, uh, the size of the code, and so you, you can prove the, the bounds of the, the data that you're using. Can you prove bounds on the size of the programs that you're generating? Because when you have a grammar that restricts um, it's your grammar that's restricting the termination condition. You're going to end up with a lot more code than if you were to encode something with jumps and then to prove that it terminates. Um, and yeah, the, the proving part is uh, going to be a really important aspect of getting this safe. Uh, it's, yeah, so the, the answer is no. We can't like prove that or guarantee it. Um, in the long, long term, if, if this idea gets traction, we'd like to like someday have an LLVM compiler. It might be easier to do it in that context to, to create guarantees like that. Um, I also think that, that like our emphasis on metaprogramming might be able to mitigate that in the long term because ultimately the AST that you generate uh, is a result of running a racket program and so that racket program can be as smart as, as it can be. Um, in deciding like what exactly to output, if that is helpful. <laughs> Carrying reasoning through macros is a really hard problem. I'll just leave it at that. Oh. <laughs>